Hi everyone, welcome to our virtual ILS NYC 2021 event broadcasts. Um, please visit the event website to see the details of our kind sponsors without who we couldn't put on this event, as well as to view all the video content from the conference, which will be archived there. As we look at the development of the insurance linked securities market, always with one eye to the future, um, this year we focus on defining the next generation of the sector. And for this broadcast, I'm delighted to be joined by Niklaus Hilti, Head of ILS at Specialist Investment Manager, Credit Suisse Insurance Link Strategies. Thanks for joining me, Niklaus. Thank you. Thank you for the invite, Steve. Sure, good to see you. So with Niklaus, we're going to be discussing a forward-looking, perhaps blue sky view of the ILS market and what it could become over the next decade. So quite lofty ideas here that we can uh, define the future, but um, I thought it'd be interesting to get your views given um, the expertise that you have and your team and the scale you have in the industry. So Niklaus, before we look ahead, perhaps it's worth taking a look at what the ILS market has done really well over the last decade and set the scene a little bit. And let's break it down into different segments and start with the catastrophe bond market, which has been slower to grow, but um, really has become a staple of insurer and reinsurer risk management. What do you think the market has done well here to help sustain the cap on market segments growth? I think for the cap on market, Probably the 2008, 2009 uh, crisis, I would say, with the structural elements where there was still some market risk, some credit risk involved. I think the fact that the market was able to adapt quickly to clean it up and to have structures involved now where uh, almost guaranteed that the correlation stays low to financial markets. Um, I would say that is one of the most critical um, elements in the history of the capital market, cleaning that, getting over it and come up with a clean structure. And, and I think from there onwards, um, yeah, I think the, 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 the growth was a, was a success. Capital market also has been growing into into the market which needed most uh, the the capital and that was the whole idea of the ILS market is to focus on those market regions where the reinsurance market capitalization possibly is not large enough to absorb shock events so namely Florida um, I think the market has grown in a very substantial way over the last decade and has been very successful. So I would say these two things are really key from a success factor, clean structure. And then the second one is really to go, to go where capital actually is needed and provide capacity, bringing capital market. And I think this is what the capital market actually did and, and why it was successful, I would, I would say. Mm. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually, because um, the cap bond market has always sort of maintained its focus in that respect, I suppose, where collateralized vehicles have expanded their focus um, a little bit more. Um, so if we look at the collateralized side, obviously, there's a number of different structures there, but perhaps one of the longest established was the sidecar vehicle, which again, I suppose, was designed to bring in capital when it was really needed after event. Um, so they seem to be a vehicle that's come in and out of favour a little bit, but the premise of supporting the industry has been a strong one, hasn't it? Absolutely, yes. It has been has been something where I would say a year ago we saw we saw volumes going down significantly. Even so, I think over the recent weeks um, there hasn't been probably a week with at least one announcement of a, of a sidecar type of, of launch. So I would say, yes, this is, this is something which comes and goes in, in, in waves, but it's again, I would say it's something which is natural. Sidecars are mostly, mostly the risks uh, where, where reinsurers feel like they need additional capital to, to, to support it. Uh, so they can't take uh, more risk capital from the balance sheet. And, and then for that, they are basically seeking uh, additional capital. 
And this, of course, is something which is cyclical in nature. Uh, there are market phases where, where, where it is so attractive that it makes sense to have a little bit more capital at hand. And then there are times where uh, probably it's less attractive and, and reinsurance companies have to look after their own balance sheet. So I would expect that sidecars um, also in the futures, they come and go. Um, as the name says, they are somehow second choice or sidecars in it's not the main car. And that means also that, that reinsurers probably only do that um, in times where, where they can't, um, can't get enough capital from the balance sheet. So I, I would say that that is not, not really going to change. I think according to our, to our statistics and data, the, the sidecars, historically, they, they didn't perform as well as, for example, the cap bond market um, you mentioned earlier. So from a risk return perspective, I would say the cap bond market definitely has outperformed the, 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 the sidecar market. Another element I would say is something which I see a bit as a critical element on the sidecar um, market is that there is an asymmetry between shareholders and, and, and the sidecar investors. And I think this could lead potentially to, 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 some, um, to some displeasure, I would say, uh, from the investor side. Uh, when there is a big asymmetry materializing once around a certain event. Yeah, that's an interesting one around alignment with sidecars. Um, and some of, some of the vehicles we've seen this year appear to be funded by um, the same investors who may be funding the balance sheet. They're often private equity type investors rather than the more familiar institutions like pensions that we see in ILS funds and cap bonds. Um, so another difference there. Um, when we look at the broader collateralized reinsurance and retrocession market, um, that's where most of the growth has come from over the last decade or more in ILS. Um, what, what, why do you feel that segment managed to grow so successfully and so fast? I think it's probably uh, it's it's probably because the cap bond market um, didn't grow quickly enough so i think it it was driven by by the by the su supply the supply of capital so i think the investors were looking for for the asset class um, wanted to to invest into the asset class but the cat bond market was probably not growing quickly enough and 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 I think this is at least from my perspective, this is probably why why the collateralized market has has grown substantially is really to 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 satisfy that supply of 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 capital and and making up to a certain degree the, the lack of growth on the on the cat bond market. The 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 the, the slow pace of growth on the cap bond market is something which is not untypical in a softening or soft market environment. I think seedings or sponsors, they have the choice to go in a very traditional way or to, to, to issue a, a cat bond. I think especially in soft market environments, they, they probably choose, um, choose more frequently to go in the traditional way where they probably get uh, better cover um, than in the, on the cat bond side, but definitely for investors, I would say it's exactly the opposite. So I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if in this hardening phase now, we will see a growth of the cat bond market over the next, over the next couple of years. Again, mm -hmm. another phase of accelerated growth. Yeah. Yeah, it does seem that a lot of investors are very keen on the cap bond structure itself with the liquidity it offers as well. Um, so if you think about um, perhaps a quick question on the fund and investment vehicle side of things. So what I guess under underpins and what you store the contracts in before you then offer it to your investor base. 
What do you think the market's done well there in sort of servicing its investors over the last decade? I think I think the the number one uh, element I would say which which is critical and which I see as a as a very positive is that that the the let's say ILS uh, ILS um, tax treatment but also ILS frameworks. Um, have expanded in in a number of jurisdictions, um, for example, to mention here the UK, but also Singapore, and I think this is something which I think is a positive thing for the long run. It gives again, it gives more channels where risk can be um, issued, where where risk transfer can happen. So I think this is a positive thing. The the the, the second development developments we have seen is um, a number of, of, of structures from the different regulation of, of reinsurance vehicles in the number of jurisdiction so that they are that they are classes of reinsurers which are fit for the purpose of ILS. I think this is something I see as a very positive development on really the risk transfer side. And on the fund side as well, it's it's a similar development where you see more and more um, fund fund structures investing into ILS. Um, these can be more regulated, like interval funds. These can be USIT funds. These can be um, less regulated from from a number of of jurisdictions. So. Again, I would say is there is a huge flexibility um, around um, a lot of different jurisdictions where one can set up those type of, of fund investments. And I think this is this is important because it allows it allows uh, the it allows the ILS industry to actually distribute to the different investors and and to to also meet the different regulatory frameworks which have been changing over over the last decade with an enormous pace and i feel i feel that the ILS industry was actually doing a very good job in in meeting these these changing and higher requirements from a regulatory point of view and has a variety of, of fund formats to, to, to distribute to investors. So pretty positive development, um, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously one of the one of the premises of the ILS market to begin with was distributing risk and accessing wide sources of capital. So really all of that sort of plumbing is, um, is really vital to the product offering. Um, so if we now look forwards rather than back, um, what do you think the RLS market needs to do to ensure itself of, itself of success and growth over the next decade? And perhaps we can run through the segments again briefly, sort of starting with the catastrophe bond market. What's your sort of outlook there and what do you think people need to do to continue growing that segment? I think on the cat bond market side, I would say the the... To a certain degree, the cap bond market probably has has fulfilled the the original the original idea um, of bringing capital to the to the insurance reinsurance industry, where probably, as I said earlier, where the industry felt initially in the 90s that the reinsurance market is maybe not capitalized enough to be able to absorb some of the shock events around natural catastrophes. And of course, the peak uh, exposure is Florida and remains Florida. And, and I think here, just as a, as a, as a, as a rough as a, as, a, as a rough measure here, I would say the capital market has brought uh, two thirds of the cap bonds are exposed roughly to to that region, and and therefore has brought about 20 billion overall. The ILS industry probably has brought 
out of the 90 billion, about 60 billion, almost 60 billion for US hurricane risk and the significant number of billions to, to, the, to the Florida market. So I think the eyeless industry has done what, what was the original, the, the original idea and concept um, of it. Now the question is, the question is, and I would frame it like this is, if, if, we, if we have a, or if we continue to have a protection gap where, where probably due to large natural catastrophes, less and less risk is actually going to end up in the insurance industry. So there's no insurance per, uh, purchased and more risk remains um, on, on the broader economy rather than going into the insurance industry. I have to say is I feel if that is the case, we will probably not see a very significant growth um, of, of, of that market segment. So if you ask me, I think, I think we, we, we of course can grow another 10, 20% over the next couple of years on the cat bond market, but I think it fulfilled the, the, the idea, the purpose here in combination with the collateralized and the broader ILS market. So I think it's really about thinking about the industry where, where, are, where are the gaps today? Over, over the last couple of months and quarters, I read a number of articles and I saw and, and watched a lot of people saying that pandemic risk is not insurable. I'm, I'm always a bit puzzled is I understand that it is not insurable because it's a huge risk, but on the other hand, I think this is exactly this is exactly where where growth should be for the insurance industry is the very critical risk. It is about pandemic risk. It is about uh, possibly life mo mortality, longevity risk, uh, big trend risks. It can be it can be cyber again. This is also a risk which is very very large, and it is almost impossible to diversify the risk. But I think the industry, and I mean the industry, the insurance industry, I think needs to pick up that risk and then be able to transform that into the capital market. And I think then the overall capital market, including the cap on market will grow because this is the whole point about the cap on market. The ILS market is it brings capital to areas where the insurance reinsurance industry is struggling to absorb the, the, the risk or the type of events which are out there. And I personally think the, 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 the whole pandemic situation we are in, I think it, it shows that this is one of the major natural catastrophes, if you, if, if you will, uh, which, which is almost crying for, for insurance solutions, helping to take away that volatility it creates on the P&Ls of, of, of commercial and private um, business owners. And, and I think that is a huge opportunity actually for the insurance industry, but also for the ILS industry in the long run. Mm, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think um, the, the pandemic has really shown us where where a protection gap exists that um, that needs addressing quite quite directly by the industry, and the industry really needs to do better than just say it's uninsurable. Um, some of it is certainly insurable, as we as we all know, but there are elements within it, such as government um, government decisions over lockdowns, which are clearly less insurable <laughs> or not insurable. Very difficult to second guess political will, unfortunately. Um, so that's really interesting. So if we then look at the sidecar structure, is there anything there that you think will change over time? Do you think they're going to become more permanent vehicles for people or do you think they'll always be sort of a, a more sort of tactical vehicle that gets rolled out when, when the rates and market conditions need it? 
I think if, you, if I'm looking at the overall capitalization of the reinsurance industry, I think it is more than adequate. And, and, and uh, I think we've seen, we've seen in 2020 that basically losses are, are replaced by new capital coming in. And, and therefore, I feel, I feel that sidecars really become um, probably something which is more an opportunistic vehicle for the short term. It's also, I, I, haven't done, I haven't done research on that. It's just perception I have is that a lot of the recent sidecars which were, which were launched were, were raised for, for, for the retrocession market. And, and if I'm looking at the retrocession market here, um, I think it's a, it's a market where there's less demand because pricing is generally, generally uh, pretty high. So there is less demand on the buying side and on the capital side, we have seen a significant inflow of additional capital um, for the 1st of January renewal. That is why I think and, and the market reacted only, I would say in, a, in somehow a disappointing way, but it shows that the market is more efficient, first of all, so capital immediately comes in when it is needed, uh, but it also means that probably this capital in the, on the sidecar side is there more on, on, a, on an opportunistic and short-term basis, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's certainly how it seems to be perceived in the industry these days as a structure. Um, if we look at collateralized reinsurance and retrocession more broadly, um, obviously it's the area that's grown the quickest in the past. It's likely to continue expanding um, in line with the industry size, I would guess. Um, but do, do you think perhaps that could accelerate again if people can find ways to bring in capital more efficiently? Um, or, or do you think more investors might be sort of turned towards ILS structures as a way to access insurance market returns? Definitely. I think it's, um, it's, it's definitely something I would expect that, that the, the classes of business we, we, we discussed earlier where there are clearly protection gaps today, be it on the pandemic side, can be on the longevity risk. It can be on the on the cyber side. But even think about if if that is the case. If we if we if we see over the next decades, for example, all the alternative energy production infrastructure um, growing with a pace probably unseen. And if you look at those values. Um, those values can be very concentrated. They can be very exposed. Um, there can be other complex global risks associated with it. For example, the, the topic around blackouts and, and grid lines, uh, which become very complex to manage and, and exposed. And, and I think this value development, I would say, is, is, is going to, is going to, to have also um, its growth in the insurance, reinsurance, but also ILS industry. So, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that the ILS industry will, over the next, the next decades, I would say, I would almost say is like, like in over the last process, I see we are somewhere there. Um, so the purpose is fulfilled. And then the next one, I think, is then really the, the, the cyber topic, the pandemic topic. So all the major risks, maybe also um, um, blackout topics and, and energy infrastructure um, values. So I think that is where there will be, dem there will be a demand for, for, for capital from the insurance industry to close those those gaps and and I think secretized structures but also um, definitely through the flexibility of of collateralized structures 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great point that there's um, a significant build up and exposures at the moment, um, which really, in a lot of cases, aren't yet being addressed by insurance um, as sort of progress and technology and new industries come on come on stream in mass. And that moves us on nicely to the next question, which is really around sort of product design, um, as well as obviously the products that we have today. Um, risk transfer itself is going to change going forwards as well, and I would hope the RLS market will be an area of innovation for that. Um, do you foresee opportunities there in making it better protection, more capital friendly and more efficient, perhaps? My guess is that that still somehow today there, there are most of the structures they try to 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 extract a relative liquid stream of returns out of the industry. And, and I think this is something I would expect is, is changing. I think there will be a bifurcation. So there will be, there will be a demand for very liquid investments um, with ILS background, but also I think there will be a bit more flexibility around longer term investment time horizon uh, to extract to 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 extract value um, out of the ILS industry and I think this is this this longer term perspective of investors will then result of course also in vehicles which are a bit more long term oriented but also very important is it will allow to 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 be a more optimal capital fitting the nature of the underlying risk where it is something insurance reinsurance is something which is a longer term uh, has a longer term time horizon and i think this is something I, I i wouldn't be surprised if we see a significant development more into private equity type, private equity type of structures when it comes to to fund structures and so on to fit the long-term nature of the underlying. Mm, and that's obviously very appropriate for trend like risks such as climate related trends as well. And um, when companies are trying to protect themselves against um, perceived worsening of weather conditions, but also conditions such as sea level rise, those longer term structures could be key really and, um, and make very interesting investment opportunities as well, I suppose. That's a very good point, absolutely, yeah, because these are the key risks uh, we are dealing with and uh, the industry needs to address it, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And if we think about the customer base on the sort of seeding company side, how, how do you feel that expands? Is that just going to be a natural growth alongside the insurance industry or can ILS perhaps go increasingly direct as well? I think we saw, especially in the cap bond market, we saw a very interesting, an interesting development over probably the last couple of quarters, where, where um, a new, new sponsors came to the market, and and I think this is something we will see in the future more and more that 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 there might be directly a corporate uh, issuing a cap bond, a corporate trying to get uh, protection uh, because it's also the case that if you look at some of these uh, corporate risks, they are enormous. I mean, these companies, they are, they are really big um, and they have market size, which is, which is enormous. And I think alongside with that, it can well be that that there is there is a more direct link uh, into the ILS industry. Absolutely, I think that's that's very feasible. Mm, yeah, and we've seen some great examples with people like Google coming to the market this year, and then um, the Bayview cap bonds, which are essentially issued straight out of a out of a corporation almost or a fund structure, as it is. Um, it's very very interesting to see those and the, the mm -hmm. scale of the risk that sits in captives and or just embedded in companies which is not insured, um, the capital requirements to support that are clear. So I guess to sum up, um, we've looked sort of at the, what's gr helped the market to grow and now what, what might happen going forwards, but what would you urge the market to sort of keep in mind and consider 
to ensure that it's able to capitalize on the growth opportunities that are going to come its way? What, what is it really important that managers and investors consider going forwards? I think the most important thing is the, to deal with protection gaps. I think to be open and, and in, that's my personal view to to, to exclude risk and to not to insure risk in the first place, I think is probably the wrong answer to, to our society and to, to the economy. And I think the insurance industry together with the ILS industry um, will see a very interesting growth path uh, over, over the next decades if we are starting to address uh, what are the biggest risk in, in, in this global economy and how can we how can we address those and how can we come up with with structures where insurers, reinsurers, but also the capital market play an important role. And I think this is this is what I think insurance is about. It is something which serves the society. And, and in order to be successful, I think the ILS industry also needs to to be part of that and, and think about think about risk transfer and what are the biggest risks and I think then it will be a very a very um, uh, successful story over the next decades. But from my perspective, this is now really going to the next level and and is moving on. I would say on the on the catastrophe side, it has proven it works. It's there. And I think this now can be applied to all the top risks, uh, which which are in our global economies. Yeah, no, that's a, a very interesting future. Anyway, if that comes to comes to fruition, um, and I guess alignment is really key as we move forwards as well. Um, as you mentioned, with insurers and reinsurers, but also the ILS market finding ways to fix some of these sort of societal issues and close the protection gaps together. So, thank you, Nicholas. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Steve. It was nice great. talking to you. Thank yeah, you very great, much. Great to talk with you. Thank you.